Welcome to another episode of Out of the Pods. I'm Deep T. And I'm Natalie. Guys, we are so excited to be back. We took last week off for the U.S. 4th of July holiday, and we are rested and ready to podcast pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, I love that. I'm actually not that rested, though. I'm actually really tired. Wait, why? I I feel like we went to New York and yeah. then I've been in Seattle. I just got back yesterday. And for some reason, I went to bed at like 5 a.m. So I'm like, Ooh, let's get it. You and I were also on the phone for a long time last night. Yeah. So like two and a half hours. I know. We were just like catching up. Um, New York was so much fun, though. We went to interview with Fortune magazine. And also we were invited to a dinner with SoFi, um, which was so cool because we met a bunch of other women content creators and entrepreneurs. And that was like such a good dinner. Like we saw Raven from season three, which was really fun Mm -hmm. because we've been talking to her for a while, like via our DMs. And then to see her in person was really cool. It was. And Cynthia from Real Housewives of Atlanta. I was like, oh, there's an icon amongst us. Uh, it's literally. It really cool. And she is so beautiful in person. She's so gorgeous. Yes. I mean, she was a model, so it makes sense. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but how was Seattle? Anything fun happen? Seattle was just, oh my God, we were on the boat every single day. We jet skied. It was such a beautiful house right on the water. We were at Mercer Island. And um, this was, um, I went for like a brand trip, but I ended up just hanging out with my manager because her family's from there. And it was so much fun. I was like, wow, I didn't know Seattle was more than just, you know, a city. I Why did my head go to um, Twilight? I was like, it's going to be depressing and rainy because it was like in Forks, Washington. Oh, Twilight. Yes. Oh, you meant Twilight, like the book slash movie. Yes. Twilight, like the movie. (laughs) Gosh, I used to have such a crush on Edward Cullen. (laughs) You were team Edward. I was. was Were you team Jacob? No, I was team Edward. Me too. But I did have a crush on Jacob. But, you know, werewolves, not my thing. Vampires please sign me up. (laughs) I was like, please go for the neck. (laughs) Yes, go. (laughs) Um, Wait, did you meet up with anyone from the cast, the season four cast? Oh, yeah, I did. I I met up with Bliss and Zach and they had just got back from Europe. So they were exhausted and then they were like back on the road. So it was really cool. We got brunch. It was always, you know how it is with them. It's just so easy to talk to them for hours. But yeah, it was a good time. That's so fun. Okay, while you were gone, I... I was going to say, yeah, what (laughs) happened in your life? Let's go. Well, first, I have like an upper respiratory virus right now. Uh, Who I got it from. Ooh. She gave it to me. No. No, She gave it to me. I am so sure you gave it to me before you left. I literally didn't even see you. I know, but I think I got it. I think I got it through the phone. Kiss me through the phone. (laughs) Get me sick through the phone. <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> while you were gone, though, I went to um, two events. I went to the Charlotte Tilbury Chicago event, which was so amazing. Um, I spoke with, like, a few members of their executive team. So if you guys don't know Charlotte Tilbury, it's, like, a makeup brand. Um, and I met so many, like, fashion and beauty influencers in Chicago. And it's crazy, like, how big that community is. But that was really mm-hmm. fun. And then... My most fun event that I went to <laughs> was the Chicago NHL Blackhawks draft watch party. Yes. I'm so sad I missed these events. Uh, that well, one looked really fun. Okay. That one I was really confused why like we were even <laughs> invited because I went and all the other like influencer influencers I met were like like sports or like hockey influencers. And so I was kind of like this odd person out. I brought my sister along with me. Um, Wait, Natalie, can I just tell you, it was so funny to see you and your sister's story of when you were attempting to hit the puck into the goal. Of the net. <laughs> and you hit the cameraman. <laughs> I know guys. Okay. So there was this like activity there where you like hit a hockey puck into this like fake net, and, but I did it. And I hit one of the workers with my puck. And he DM'd me being like, hey, I still have that bruise on my ankle. <laughs> I I was like was so, so embarrassed. Funny. I was so embarrassed. There was so much net and there he's just this tiny little thing in the corner and you're like, you yeah. hit him straight in the ankle. Okay, like, do you ever get so embarrassed that you like overshare? 
Like you just like need to feel better about the situation. So you like kind of like tell everyone that's why I posted that video on my story because I was like, I'm so embarrassed that I just need to like share it so that I feel less embarrassed. But then I felt more embarrassed when he DM'd me and I was like, oh my gosh, like, please. Um, the that lives on. But um, it was so much fun because I, all these like sports influencers, they're just, they're really, really fun to hang out with. Um, I can't remember their like names right now, but uh, there's <laughs> two men who um, have a hockey podcast and they were just like hoots. They were so funny. One of them, I think his name is Swaggy Pete, but he does like tricks on YouTube, like hockey stick tricks. I don't know. I need a link. I need a but link to this. The kindest man I've ever met. And then there was like this, I don't really know what they do. They're this hockey influencer group of these like 24 and 25 year olds. There's like six or seven of them. And I think they do acapella. Uh, I'm confused. They acapella? Acapella, like the singing. Yeah, but how does that have to do with anything with hockey? Are they singing hockey I think tunes? that they, I think from what I remember, they all met playing hockey in college. Oh, and then, so the hockey, is the hockey separate from the acapella or is they, do they go hand in hand? Maybe they sing like hockey songs. I don't know. Is there any hockey songs? Yeah, like, you know, when we go to the Blackhawks games, they like play something. Like there's they a song. They just play the radio. <laughs> no, no. Oh, you mean like the Black Sox song? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think. Okay. Maybe they're the ones that sing those. <laughs> clearly, you didn't really learn that much at this I'm hockey literally event. literally drooling because I'm like literally being so awkward. But anyways, <laughs> I'm. I met one of like the members of this like group, um, and is that he... weird drooling? <laughs> no, I was just being awkward earlier. But anyways, I met okay. one of the members of the group, and we. Like, he was so nice. I, like, developed a little crush. He was just, like, so cute, so nice. Um, but I found out he was 25. <laughs> and I was like, what? Because <laughs> he, he literally had, like, a full-ass beard. And I was like, I thought, like, men hit puberty at 25. And you have, like, a full-ass <laughs> beard. I thought you were, like, straight up 30. It was wild. But I want to ask you this. Would you ever yes. date a 25-year-old? So Deep D and I are – I'm 31 and Deep D is 32 for reference. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting question. And I, when I was talking to you yesterday about this, I had a realization. And usually I date younger. So 25 you do? is like I, – I do usually date younger. I don't know I what it is when I'm out. I always attract younger. I didn't know like, that. Okay, cool. Yeah. But – 25, I think, is a little young for me. That's like a lot of, that's a lot of years left for this little kid to live. <laughs> okay. I, would you? I, no, I don't think I would. Because here is why. It's not the fact that there's like a six-year age difference between me and this guy. It's like where we are in life. Like when I was 25, mm -hmm. I was like insane. Like I was just like crazy. <laughs> Yeah, we were trying to figure things out. Like, we yeah, didn't life like was, I really. didn't really have like a sense of identity yet. And I was kind of just like living life. And then now at 31, I'm like, you know, like my values have changed. Um, I'm more established. And like, I want someone in the same, like, in the same place of life I'm currently at. And I don't see like a 25 year old having that. Maybe they could. Maybe there's like an anomaly out there, but I don't. I don't think he was it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, de I've definitely met some younger men who are very mature for their age and they know what they want and, you know, they're like ready to get married and they're like all about it. But it seems like most are still figuring out their way, like you said. Yeah. So yeah. hard to weed out. <laughs> but it was so crazy until he said his age, I was like, oh my gosh, like he's probably around my age. He's like very mature and then he's like oh I'm 25 and I was like oh and he's like how old are you and I was like 31 and he's like oh my gosh you look 24 and I was like that still doesn't change the fact that I'm 31. <laughs> Best compliment though I love getting compliments like that. Thank I, you. I, I think I feel like he just got flustered and he's probably like uh 
He's like, oh. Yeah. So anyways, um, but uh, after that, I feel like once you get like age in your mind, you're like very aware, like how they are. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I, I do say like, I do try to go for younger men, but I think I've come to the relationship realization that the reason I do that is because maybe I'm not looking for anything serious. But now mm. that like I'm getting into the phase where I'm like, okay, no, I really want to find my person now. I'm like, okay, let's go older because you're right. They're just more established. They know what they want. Yes. And, you know, okay. Yeah. I was just saying that. Like, I feel like when we date men around our age or older than us, I like mm -hmm. the fact now that like, there's not a lot of guessing for the future. Like I, I know like their careers are like a little bit more established um, versus like when someone is in their early twenties and like their like values and motivations in life. So I just love that aspect. Mm -hmm. And they want to have kids sooner and that's a priority yeah. for me. So it's like, yeah, like our visions on the future align, like the paths align more. So I guess I have to give up the younger men. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> wow. That's gonna be but a <laughs> anyways, I was kidding. just thinking about that when I was talking to this guy. Um, <laughs> But he did kind of like blow up my love life, which I was like annoyed at myself for. So his name just got like stuck in my head for some reason. It's really close to the name of a guy I'm seeing. And um, the next date I went on with this guy I'm seeing, I actually called him by the 25-year-old's name twice. Dude, rookie mistake. That means your crush is on your mind. Oh, man, he is not just my crush. You literally <laughs> called him your crush earlier. Oh, did I say I had a little crush on him? He was like cute, like whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyways, and Dude, now the, the guy I'm seeing thinks I'm like dating other people or like being like, if like Willy Wonky, what's the name? What's the word? And uh -oh. and and now, <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my gosh. So that's, I feel like that's already on like the downturn. <laughs> it's like, oh no. I was like, cool. Cause I didn't know how to explain. I was like, I don't know where that name came from. I was like, what? <laughs> And okay, this is so bad. I was going to say this, but I was dating a doctor. Um, and I'm not saying it like I was dating him because of the money or anything, but like I've always wanted to date a doctor so I could ask them like all these medical questions, like what's wrong with me? Like if I have a little itch in my throat, I want a, a, a strep test right there and then. Yeah, yeah, I want you to swab my throat for strep right there. I want you to look at the idea my of throat romance <laughs> and be like, oh, it's inflamed. I want you to touch my lymph nodes and tell me if they're swollen or not. You know, like that's what I want. That is we can my do that ourselves. No, because I overthink it. I'm like, are they swollen? Are they not? <laughs> so I was like, I want to marry someone uh, who could be my webmd.com. <laughs> I have cousins for that. <laughs> I don't. I don't like think I have anyone. Sure. So, um, so I was kind of sad because I was oh. like, I just saw this future where I could ask him all these, you know, questions like, it's Hey, okay. why There's is a lot of doctors out here in Chicago? I know, but this 25 year old just ruined it and he doesn't even know it. He's probably like hopscotching with his life out in the world. I've never heard the term hopscotching around the world in my life, but you then know, again, like <laughs> You know, like hopscotch. <laughs> Anyways, okay, that Arca was it. He's arcapelling, arcapelling. He's acapelling around, <laughs> around the world, and he doesn't know that he literally ruined my perfect relationship. And so. he didn't know that he's actually arcapelling in your head. <laughs> That's funny. That was so stupid. Whatever. Uh, I'm funny. Anyways, okay. Well, can you guys like let uh, us know? Would you ever date someone who is younger than you? Like, if you were in your 30s, would you date? someone in their mid 20s dm us comment let us know because our answers are no is your answer no Pro probably not it depends on the 25 year old <laughs> i think mine's like a a, a hard, hard no, no. Oh, yeah poor crush Thanks. i'm sure he'll live i'm sure he's just acapelling out on social media <laughs> with his hockey fans Anyways, we are so excited to talk to Tiff from The Ultimatum. We have been waiting Woo. for this interview, and we hope you guys enjoy it. We are so excited for our guest this week from The Ultimatum, Queer Love. Tiff, welcome. I've been a big Out of the Pods fan Yay. for some time now. <laughs> so here I am. I, I DM'd you guys. I'm like, oh my God, I would love to be on the show. <laughs> I feel like I won like the, the Willy Wonka chocolate ticket, you know? <laughs> yes. 
I don't know if that shows how old I am, but yeah. Oh, wait, I love that. Well, it's so crazy because before we saw your DM, Deepti and I were chatting when we were like watching the show and recapping it on our podcast. We're like, oh my gosh, you know, who would be really good to have as a guest who can just speak like really authentically? And we're like, Tiff, we got to get Tiff. And then we saw your DM and we're like, oh my gosh, like this is so exciting. So we are like ecstatic to talk to you because there's so much we want to know. Um, but before we get into that, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from, your age, relationship status? Yeah. Um, so my name's Tiff. Um, I'm originally from the DMV area, so Washington, D.C. Um, about four years ago, I moved to San Diego, which is the location of the filming of The Ultimate and Queer Love. And um, yeah, I mean, right now I am, I suppose dating, but you know, just keeping it at that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I, don't think I could, uh, don't be so little... coy to yeah. <laughs> yeah. We came in with the big question. I know. It's like, hit me off right with that. I don't know if I could just like handle another, like, kaboom, like again, like, in yeah. life. I, I like, it was already really bad of like the kaboom, the big kaboom of my uh, relationship <laughs> three weeks ago. So I yeah. think it needs to hold off a little bit. <laughs> That's funny. Wait, so tell us, like, how did you end up on the ultimatum queer love? Yeah, I um, I actually had a casting producer reach out to me via Instagram. Um, they did not look up the hashtag lesbian Latina. That's, that's not the hashtag I think they looked up. No. <laughs> no. Um, no, they looked up. Um, I don't know if they looked up. But anyways, uh, they reached out to me and they were like, hey, here's we're filming the show we're the same producers as love is blind um and this is what we're looking for they kind of three or four bullet points right one's ready to get married one's Mm -hmm. not been in a relationship somewhere between like a year and a half and four years a couple other criteria um you know is that something you're interested in so you know you know how southern california can be you know everyone's kind of like thirsty to be on tv and yada 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 i've (laughs) never thought about that in my life like ever once and I came over to Southern California right um so I was like thanks for the offer but um yeah no I don't I don't think I'm good for this so I actually turned it down and really interesting yeah, yeah I, just, I turned it down but here my Aquarius uh Aquarius <gasps> nature Aquarius. are you an Aquarius let's lady? go no, let's yes. go, let's go. <laughs> so that curious nature It's like, wow, I've never talked to a casting producer before. I don't even know what a producer does, you know? So Mm -hmm. here I am like networking with this producer for the next day and a half. And I'm like, what's your favorite part of being a producer? (laughs) And, um, you know, she actually did cast a couple people off of uh, Love is Blind, like I think three and stuff. Um, I know your casting casting producer, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's her. And, um, And so we whip back around and a day and a half later or so she's like, so wait, why don't you think that you're like not good for this position? And, um, I was like, well, you know, my, my, or we're actually on a break right now, Mildred and I, and, um, you know, we have talked about marriage in the past, but we're not in a good place. We can't communicate. Maybe if we were to learn to communicate better, then we could be in a better place to then talk about it again. But we're just like, not in a good place right now. And then she goes, I think that's what we're looking for. <laughs> They're like, you're the perfect candidate for this. <laughs> Literally, you are. <laughs> so, you know, the casting process was like three, four months, and then we got the call. And within 10 days, we had to pick up everything and just leave and go. Yeah. Wow. Within 10 days, yeah. Natalie and I had to wait like a year. Really? Yeah. Oh, Our casting pandemic. process was about a year long, and I think they gave us a month notice. A month. Like from oh, the time they told us we were final cast to when we – um, got on that plane to LA to the okay, pod. So, so our, the casting process for us was three to four months, but when we got okay. the call, it was like 10 days ago. Ah. Oh, interesting. Okay. But lucky for you, you were actually in the location where they were filming. So, yeah, but yeah. was everyone else, like everyone was from out of state, right? Yeah. For the most part, a little bit. Um, Mildred and I actually during, before filming, we lived up in Long Beach for a little bit. Don't recommend it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, now, so, yeah, everyone else lives somewhere different. Um, Xander and Vanessa were actually from Hawaii. Hawaii. And you have Yoli and Mal from Seattle, which they did move from Chicago. They're originally from Chicago. Um, That's right. And yeah, like other bits and pieces of uh, Lexi and Ray were from Orange County. So 
yeah, just a little bit speckled yeah. all over. Yeah. But they originally started casting in Seattle. And wow. so for your viewers, when it comes to the queer, lesbian, sapphic world, um, <laughs> it's a very small world. So we tend to go to the same bars and tend to see the same people. And if you can imagine, we couldn't cast in just one city um, because I probably would have already dated a third of them. Um, so like <laughs> That was like us. That yeah, was yeah. like our Chicago. Yeah. That's um, actually funny. Because <laughs> we're for our season. So for Love is Blind, it's city based. Um, and so for our season, we're obviously all Chicago based. And the more we were talking to each other in the pods, like the men on the other side were like, wait, like, yeah. I, I think I know you or know someone that knows you Ooh. or like we've met before. It was yeah. crazy. And it's yeah. typically not like that. But Chicago is weird where like if you are like because we're all around the same age, we all kind of hung out in the same area. Like that's Chicago. It's like people hang out in it's different like a... areas by age. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And there's so few neighborhoods that people hang out in. And mm -hmm. so it was very strange, but that's, the, so I get yeah. why like you guys are from different <laughs> um, locations. That makes yeah. sense. Take that like as a, um, you know, like a big city like Chicago, like the third most populous city in America or something like that. Yeah. And it, you know each other to like a second or third degree in that mm -hmm. dating world right there. But like now like slice that into like 5% that's like queer identifying, you know, and then, yeah, then yeah. put it in a smaller city and it's like, here you go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's did you, even see? Yeah. you didn't know anyone from the cast though prior. No, we did not know yeah. anybody. Um, yeah. But I will say this is, this is really funny. Um, you know, like the casting uh, producers and stuff. Well, like, Mm -hmm. A day, two days before, like when we got on set, two days before, um, they all started following us, like the producers and the casting producers and stuff. Oh, and right. so we're like, oh, if they're following us, they're probably following the other cast members too. Oh, so we're, yes. what Mildred and I did, we looked up the little thing of like who they were following to, and they're only following like 600 people. We're like, okay, we're just going to look for rainbow flags, rainbow flags. So we're like, oh, oh that's oh. funny. I knew who I found out two days before on set, like when I, when we met the couples and that night, uh, we see the cocktail night where Joanna comes out and everything. Um, two days before that, uh, I found out who everyone was except for Sam and Aussie. Wow. Yeah. Wait, Very that's really funny because that's how I found out because they we had like, you know how you can see the mutuals or whatever? Mm -hmm. There was one guy I went to college with and I had mutual with the casting director or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was like, oh no, like he's you about know? to be on the show. <laughs> yeah. I told my producer right away. I was like, don't match me with him. I don't want to go home. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Let's just keep it separate. Yeah. I was like, oh, Vito. Honest. You and Vito went to college together. Yes. Yeah. There's a, a he, he didn't get screen time on our season, but I, I remember he was telling me in the pods when I would, when I went on a pod date with him, he's like, I know deep D like mm -hmm. we went to college. It's kind of weird that <laughs> we're both here. I, I found oh, out no. who, um, the last couple who, besides uh, Sam and Aussie, who we found out like who was who, we were, we were we had uh, the COVID officers come in and like put the little thing up our nose um, every like two <laughs> days. So right before we met all the couples, uh, you know, I think I found out who like Lexi and Ray were, and I'm not the only one. So I'm not the only one that's a creep. Okay, everyone else is creeping too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they actually put, uh, or you know, they had like the little COVID test with like their names on it. And all of a sudden they go up to uh, Mildred to give her her COVID test. And the COVID officer is like, uh, hi, Yoli, nice to see you. And we looked at each other and we're like, and then she, Mildred texted me. She's like, find out who Yoli is. And I'm like, yes, yeah. so I'm scrolling, <laughs> trying to find a Yoli. And then I found Yoli now. And I was like, oh, it's them. It's them. It's them. That's funny. Yeah. That well, that's kind of cool because you guys were able to, you know, get – that you know I feel like social media says a lot about a person obviously sometimes it could be very curated but like you just find out more so that's kind of cool that you had that information going in yeah, when I first looked yeah. at Mel on the Instagram right before we all met each other yeah. I thought I could have sworn Mal was gonna be a fuck boy like a straight up fuck boy you know, just like the, like, you know, like with the ones with the hats and like the cute yes. ass dimples and like doing these kind of poses <laughs> with the couch. I'm like, 
oh, okay, she's gonna like, okay, like this is this is nerve wracking, a little, little <laughs> not feeling that great. Um, but then when I met Mal, I was like, oh, you're you have such a soft, warm energy. Like I, that that yes. threw me off for a second. Yeah, mm-hmm. she does That's have crazy. That very very like like calming presence to her. <laughs> oh my god! Wait, so do you guys had your phones on set? Like they didn't take it away? No, I mean the during the first two week dating period where we're dating everybody and then it kind of goes like an algorithm and choosing who kind of I'm pretty similar with like love is blind right and you get down to your mm-hmm. final two three people mm-hmm. um, we did not have our phones on us now um, but then a couple after a couple days after we got into our trial marriage um, then we got our phones back for the rest of the time but we were highly highly encouraged not to text our exes very interesting that makes sense too bad uh Yoli didn't follow that rule <laughs> No, I don't think so. I don't think. Uh, I don't think. Or, oh yeah, rule. Xander did follow that rule for part okay. one, but not part two. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> but did you did you watch the Ultimatum Marry or Move On before joining the show? So like the heterosexual version of the Ultimatum. Yeah, we did, and um, you know that came out uh, April 2020, 2022. and mm-hmm. we filmed from September twenty twenty one to November twenty twenty one. Um, so you didn't watch before you actually filmed no so we were filmed back to back um and we there was no the ultimatum we were just called the san diego uh queer couples project <laughs> That's oh, so wow. weird. It's like wow we had to put us in a box. so glad they changed yeah. that name <laughs> that was so exciting. um but we did know that there was a season one but with anything we were kind of like a guinea pig season as well because there was nothing that we could watch on tv that um mm-hmm sort of mimics the whole experience like the eight week process that you go through we knew that we would be dating and then having a you know choice day kind of but we didn't know what that was going to look like and then you know so we kind of knew the outline premise but to actually have it all carved out in a little you know in a presentation and with a bow tied around it and like a finished product right in front of you we didn't get to see any of that except for in april when, um, you know, Mildred and I obviously got engaged and we were still together and we watched that the day it came out and we sat down on the couch and we looked at each other and we're like, what the fuck did we sign up for? Like, what the fuck, what the fuck is this? Cause it was, I thought it was going to be kind of like, love is blind has drama. And, uh, we knew it was going to be like that cause the same production company, but like it, I mean, especially with season one of, um, Mary move on ultimatum. That shit was so unhinged, and I'm just like, Messy. I know. Are you kidding me? Like, this is what they're gonna make us look like? Like, fuck. <laughs> that that think- is a very scary thing. Like when no, you are, you off. don't you don't really know what you're going into or like signing mm-hmm. up for, or how it's gonna look on TV. Like, thankfully, Deep D and I had season one of Love Is Blind to watch before going into it, and we kind of knew like oh like there is success that comes out of this show and like oh. it does work and like lead to successful marriages and so I think that gave us a lot of solace but yeah. if I had to go in and someone called me a pro- like if the title had project in it I'd be like hmm oh my god <laughs> yeah and that's the thing I actually have a question for you real quick when um you know season one does come off so freaking genuine um yeah and then like season two all of a sudden like the drama gets cranked up a notch was that actually yeah. really what happened or did they do you think that it was just kind of like edited that way i don't uh, think it was i mean there was a definitely a lot more drama but i think as the seasons go on of any show you're gonna find that a lot more people are in it for the wrong reasons mm-hmm. and i think you see the, a few of that in our cast But like you said, season one of Love is Blind had nothing to go off of, whereas we did. So when they heard, oh, Love is Blind season two is coming, everyone's like, oh, I'm doing to do it. Uh, But a lot of some of those people are there not for the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Season one got a lot of success because it came out during like COVID or something. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I I will say the drama wasn't edited. I I don't know if there was less drama on season one or they just edited it down for their season. But if anything, I felt like they didn't show all of the drama on our season. Like there was some stuff that like really happened that I was like, this is going to look bad. Like people just talking negatively about each other, um, just like lies that were going around, but it 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 didn't show. Yeah. If it doesn't fit the congruent storyline. I mean, there were things Mm -hmm. that happened in our season where I'm like, especially in my experience, in my eyes, I'm like, they're definitely going to film this part. 
and it just mm -hmm. never got filmed. I'm never like, yes. are you kidding me? Like the yes. first um, cocktail night where you see all of us like finally all be in a room together after we dated, you know, like did a couple days mm -hmm. of dating and all come down. Um, I could have sworn that Xander and Mildred had something going on. Like, you know what I'm saying? Interesting. Like, or not. And, you know, I've already talked to Xander. Like, Xander and I are fine about it. But I, I will still, like, fucking just make fun of it to this day. But, like, Xander was in front of my face. Like, I think Xander got a little drunk or, you know, like, but was, like, hardcore hitting on Mildred in front of my face to the point where they, like, reached their arm over me. Because I was, like, talking to Mildred, right? Reached their arm over to me and then, like, backed up, like, backed me out like basketball. Literally backed me out like basketball to talk to Mildred right in front of me. And I'm just kind of like wow. a deer in the headlights because I'm like, okay, don't make a fool of myself. Because this is like first couple of days of filming. I'm like, don't. Yeah. Make and you know, you're, you're like, just adrenaline is rising. I'm like, if this mm -hmm. would have happened at like a club or a bar and someone just kind of like disrespect your person like that, I would have lost my shit. And so yeah. anyway, like. I'm like doing the OTFs, they call them on the fly interviews. And yes. Like, yep. you know, and of course it said like, how do you feel about Xander flirting with Mildred? Not, oh, is Mildred and Xander flirting? It's like, how do you feel about this? You know, and I'm just yeah. like, I'm playing it off. Right? Like, I'm playing Did you it see off. It? <laughs> I'm so playing it off. I'm like, no, like, you know, you know, I'm good. Like, playing them like a game of chess and blah, blah, blah. Like, and I just start like, just whatever, right? I play it off and they're like, okay, we're done. We're putting the cameras down. And I was like, I'm Actually, kidding. I got one more thing left to say, and they're like, hey, <laughs> they're putting them back up. And I'm like, I just, I like in those moments, right? Like, I actually lost my shit. And that's what comes with this whole thing of like the ultimatum. Um, you you want to respect the process as much as you can, but when you do come mm -hmm. in from a monogamous relationship, there is an element of it where I think anyone would be, you know. And I, oh, yeah, and so then, we talked about this. We said know. it. We're like, if you did the ultimatum, my jealousy just could not let me because no, you respect no it. But it's like you still are like, that's my partner and that my partner owes mm -hmm. me loyalty and I'm going to feel jealousy. And obviously you're going to act on that jealousy. It's it's hard. And that's I, what is really yeah. interesting about how Mal, I feel like Mal took the entire situation. And I'm not calling bullshit on Mal. I'm not calling bullshit there's clearly just something that I don't fully understand um, because I do believe that you can, she was way better at respecting the process, I think, than a lot of people. Um, and I will give that mm -hmm. to her and hats off to her for that. Um, but I also, in my gut, and I'm not saying that this is how she was thinking, I'm just trying to like rationalize it in my brain. Um, watching someone you love fall in love with someone else to keep that composure, it makes me question what would have actually been done or said without cameras around behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And I'm not calling bullshit on Mel, but it's just, maybe she's just a different breed than the rest of us. But like, I would try to have my composure as much as I could. Um, but I think I would honestly have moments where once the cameras are down that I would break the fuck down crying. Like yeah. there's no way and that I, I could not Honestly, like I relate to that. I, it was good. I definitely relate to that because I'm not one to outwardly show emotion, especially okay. in like intense situations. So like, like once the, once the cameras are off, I'm like, oh my God, let me process what just happened. And like, you're right. Like I just broke down. I was like, okay, I am unwell. But like, that's just like a, even a society thing. It's an Aquarius thing to me too, is like, I will not express my emotion whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I, nope. I, I think it's what happens when you put like normal people in front of a camera, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of like Mal in, initially filming Love is Blind, where when the cameras were on, I'd be more like closed off. I'm like, okay, I am going to have a talk with my partner like off camera about this, but I'm not gonna like show all of my emotions right now. But when, it, I don't know, because you think about like, you already have it in the back of your mind, like editing is a real thing. Like they could edit your words in every single way. And I don't want to look like crazy because I don't think I am. And I don't want to look like irrational. So I'm going to like come off as composed as I can on, on camera, even though I may act a different way when the cameras are off. Like I'd be yeah. less, you know, as composed as I was in certain scenes. So 
uh, you're yeah. you're probably right um but like kudos to mal for doing that because yeah. i think that when you stay composed when there's so much bullshit like coming at you it's just like mm -hmm. i feel like staying composed in front of the camera is a lot and see that's yeah. the thing that's the that's the weird paradigm shift of keeping your composure there, there's this balance right between keeping your composure yeah. and actually being real to yourself at the same time mm. and not just sugarcoating things for film and that's true I think maybe that's why I was a great candidate for this whole experience because I feel there's this tick inside of me that feels horrible for not being myself. And of course, mm -hmm. I'd rather be myself, make the mistakes, and then learn from those mistakes, but still be myself in the process. It's hard yeah. for me, and every personality is different, and I respect it, but for me personally, I'm just kind of like, I would do a disgrace, a disservice to my soul to like not express how I'm feeling right now. Um, I don't know how to mm -hmm. not do that. And, um, but that comes, it, it's a double-edged sword because that comes off as in a edited TV version as toxic. So right. expressing how you want, being blunt, telling what it is, you know, like in, in a context of, you know, everyday life, um, you can have 15, 20 minute conversations with someone and then for them to understand it and get around it. And we're like, Hey, we shake hands and we're good afterwards. Um, but then that boils down into, a minute and a half segment on a reality tv show and then all of a sudden you look like a toxic asshole so yeah. it, you know there it's a double-edged sword really being authentic to yourself during a tv experience it, it, it's tough yeah can you tell me what initially attracted you to mildred like what did your relation look like before the show and obviously i was physically attracted to her you know like that was mm -hmm. i mean like a given um but that actually, that's one thing too, that I wasn't like, our storyline was not just sex. Like it, it, they have to go through a storyline, right? Um, yeah. It was not just that. There were so many other layers to us and that, um, but I guess we were like the most physical on a show. So like they, they used that as part of a storyline of a- Dude, topic, when, right? when they played your uh, romantic scene, I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> At the very beginning. Well, everybody else, like, okay, okay, so wait, Natalie, so, so, um, Spark note the the question because I'm already forgetting it, but I want to talk about this okay. little scene real quick, real quick. Um, yeah. So before I get sidetracked, um, yeah, like we did. <laughs> how do I say it? Like people were like, it's staged. Um, like fifty percent um, because we found out through the grapevine, like everyone is breaking up that night, and we heard through the grapevine that everyone's like crying, everyone's having this horrible time, and I'm logically my Aquarius ass self, right? Is logically thinking through this, and I'm like. I am not like, regardless of what's going on, it's like shipping off, like to sail away at the Titanic, like goodbye. You know, <laughs> I don't know. There mm -hmm. might be a 1% chance where I'm never going to be intimate with Mildred or us have each other like connected like that ever again. Two, mm -hmm. if I am going to be not seeing her talking to her for this two week dating period. And then on top of that, a three week period with our trial marriage partner, if we're playing the entire experiment fairly, there's going to be five weeks over a month where I'm not even going to be able to like barely look at this person. I hope I will go out with a bang. Like I'm just, that's the way I see it. Like, like it's kind of like if the world's coming to an end and there's an apocalypse, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there mm -hmm. and cry? No. So that's why like, we're like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. And, um, they're like, we're all for it. Um, and it wasn't like, Oh, move her head here and kiss this way. It, wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, like, just be natural. Prop up this little area. And then when you're ready, come in. And then, and then when you are ready for us to leave, say your code word and we'll get the fuck out. And that's what they did. And they respected it. So was that wow. my toxic trait is i want to know the code word <laughs> i know I, I think it was like bubbles or something like that <laughs> like bubbles. bubbles and they're like oh bubbles I bubbles and they're like looking bubbles. down like they're like looking down go. and they just leave oh like, we already got an uh, interview system out of the way for her so we have to, like, do it afterwards yeah. that that's, that's so crazy <laughs> I mean, okay, like, so bring it back bring it back bring it back, <laughs> bring it back. okay so yeah, what so was your relation question. So the question was, what was your relationship like with Mildred before the show? Okay. Um, so yeah, there, there obviously was physical attraction, but um, to be honest, I really connected. I, I'm a big sucker for dating people that are not like me. Um, I don't know. I just, I just love different walks of life. And just in even my friendships, I'm attracted to that. She came from a very different life than me. Um, mm -hmm. And 
to be honest, I, I've grieved this with my therapist. Um, I mean, I, I've talked about this with my therapist over and over again, and I didn't see it initially in the relationship, but looking back on it, the relationship was dragged on and started and it became official. Um, honestly, for me feeling bad for her and I had no idea. I felt bad of like, oh man, like you must have gone through, you know, she grew up in, um, Compton, um, you know, and she, you know, her mom left her when she was like five and she had a child at the age of 15 alone, you know, like there, you know, she didn't learn, um, English until she was like 16 years old. And so like, she comes from a very troubled, uh, like background and dysfunctional family. And, um, you know, I come from East coast, not a perfect family, but middle class and, um, you know, we didn't have to worry about getting food on the table, you know, and I've always like, you know, I, I think she started telling me her stories and her upbringing pretty early on in the relationship. And I gravitated towards that. But I also noticed I also started excusing certain of her, uh, some of her behaviors because of her past, because she, even in the beginning started putting her, um, her past things that have happened to her as a reason of why she was acting the way she was acting. And rather than, Hey, so when it started getting a little bit ugly, um, you know, about four or five months in, I would say it started to, I mean, it was guilt tripping a little like uh, passive aggressive kind of guilt tripping um, pretty early on, I would say probably about month two, month three, but I was giving it the benefit of the doubt. I was like, man, rather than me having boundaries, cause I didn't know, I didn't express boundaries. I didn't like, and that was the biggest self-awareness wake up call getting out of that relationship. Like that's one thing I've learned about myself so much is like boundaries and boundaries is practicing self-love, right? Like, yes, man, so maybe I didn't have as much self-love like than I thought I did. Cause mm-hmm. you know, Oh, I love myself. I'm open. I'm queer. I'm this. I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks of me. That's great. But like, how do you show up when it comes to your intimate relationships? Oh, wow. Like, I didn't realize I had none. I had no boundaries. And um, mm-hmm. so I got into just giving her the benefit of the doubt for a lot of things. So when things started getting ugly and, you know, the name calling started and like things of that nature, which was before the show, I actually got to a point where I felt like maybe I didn't say it out loud that I deserved it, but I would be like, hmm, um, man, instead of, hey, you shouldn't be calling me these names. Um, sorry, cat. Hey, you shouldn't be. Oh, hello, <laughs> kitty. Ignore me. <laughs> oh, she said hi. I know. Um, but yeah, like instead of her saying like, hey, uh, instead of me saying, hey, you shouldn't be calling me these names. Um, I, I won't allow this in my space. Um, it either needs to stop or we need to figure something out or, you know, rather than doing that. Uh, it was more like, man, she must have gone through such a hard past of being discarded and thrown out and X, Y, Z. Um that she, I I can see why she would call me names. Let me try to fix that. Like that, Mm -hmm. just as one example of our entire relationship. And I never saw it until after. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll get more into that later. Um, I did want to go into your trial marriage with Sam. When the entire cast is mingling and getting to know each other, did you have an initial attraction to Sam or how did that partnership come to be yeah um so my when I met everyone I was dating everybody I did not like latch on to anyone at all um as far as like romance goes um physically I was attracted to Yoli um and Yoli and I actually were on the she was the other person who I was on dates with the entire time so we date each other for about 20 to 25 hours before we pick someone. Wow. So um, I was on dates with Yoli for like 10 days. I got to know Yoli very, very, very well. Um, And, you know, it kind of does, you know, again, stuff that you don't see on camera. Um, But, you know, I remember on Yoli and I's last date, I was actually a little conflicted. I'm like, am I going to pick Yoli or am I going to pick Sam? Like, I don't know. Um, Uh. Yoli did say to me like, Hey, you know, I was like, who else are you dating? She was like, I'm dating Xander. And, um, she was like, yeah, but like Xander's more of the safe choice. So that to me, like it's, it makes me wonder about like, again, and, and Mal nailed it. I think in a, um, like a sit down interview with Yoli was like, 
Hey, where you water the grass. I forget the saying that she said of like, yes. you just want to love someone, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But the dynamics met more with Yoli and Xander because Xander was ready for marriage, you know, and I wasn't. So that was just more of a recipe for success. But it's interesting how that like kind of happens, right? Um, but when it came to Sam, um, I, no, there was no romantic connection. Um, I didn't feel that with Sam. You do see Sam like towards the end of the trial marriage. She does kind of uh, want to open up a little bit more and lean more into it. Um, unfortunately, like I'm, I'm like a light switch. I'm kind of like I'm there. I'm not. It usually doesn't take me a long time to figure something out. Um, but I know that she was like a beautiful soul and a beautiful person and um you know maybe like deep d in your experience on love is blind like there are some things that like it's interesting now now this is all coming to me i remember after watching your season dd we already filmed i think um and i all of a sudden i thought that i was going to be like like, you know, again, these are the things that you think are going to happen, right? I was like, I'm going to be villainized. I'm going to be villainized because I now watch this, all these scenes with Deep D and, um, you know, your ex. Um, and I'm like, oh no, oh no. Because I tried to say like the nicest way possible or like these things, these things that like aren't, weren't ever really put out there. Um, but I thought that I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to look like an asshole. Like, you know, and um you know, I think it's just how you deliver that, that information. Yes. Um, but yeah, there was a exactly. time period where Sam was more um, open or wanting to try more, wanting to hold hands, wanting to do these things like kiss and things like that, just to like try it. And, you know, I never flat out said, I'm not attracted to you. I don't find you attractive. I don't think like, nothing, you know, I think she's a beautiful girl. Um, it is just, you can think people are beautiful but it doesn't yes. mean that you want to have sex with them or that you want to do something with them. And, exactly. um, you know, like, I think men are beautiful. doesn't mean I want to do anything with them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, um, so yeah, when it came to like Sam and I's relationship, um, I think it was more of like a, a spiritual connection because I was not connecting with a, anyone really on the show. It was to the point where I started feeling bad that I'm not connecting. I felt like I was doing something wrong. I felt like a, like, oh my God, I kind of felt useless for a little bit because as far as I know, everyone's connecting with people on the show and everyone's dating and everyone's going through this dating process. So everyone must be falling in love and you know, like, you know how certain people like the process that you go through, but I wasn't connecting with people. And I don't know what's going on with Mildred. I don't know if Mildred's falling in love with somebody. I don't know any of this. And I remember sitting down with, um, one of the, the EP producer. And I was like, can I have a second with you? And she was like, yeah. And um, she just, you know, I'm sure she's busy. She has all this stuff going on, on her phone. She put her phone down. And I was like, I feel like I'm doing something wrong because I'm not romantically connecting with anyone. Um, and I don't, I feel like I'm not, I feel like I'm a waste to this project because I feel like everyone should be connecting with people. Yeah. And, she was like, she looked at me dead straight in the eye and she goes, if you're not connecting with anyone, that's part of your story. And I wouldn't want you to be anything other than yourself. Um, and that like gave me permission. Cause I remember I was like crying uh, that gave me permission to say, it's okay if I'm not connecting with anyone else. Um, and yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because watching your um relationship with sam i actually like thought that towards the end of it you guys had like the most growth i don't know and like taught each other so much so i love when you say there was like a spiritual connection i think that like is very important to your story is because it doesn't have to be romantic to be able to learn something from someone else and vice versa so and it was actually through sam this is so interesting i i tell people this all the time it was because of Sam, even though there was no romantic connection, that she, for the first time, opened up my eyes to the crazy relationship that Mildred and I had. And it got me thinking. I said, hey, you know what? It might not be Sam, but I think there is someone else out there for me that can have a similar energy um, and gentleness and safe space provided 
Um, and although I'm not compatible with Sam in that category, that those are traits that I can be compatible with someone else. And I remember those thoughts going through my brain when I was with Sam in the relationship. So it doesn't, the ultimatum doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be with that one person that you're a trial person with. That could just give you a little taste of, Hey, you know what, just in general, there can be someone else out there for you. That actually did ring through my brain multiple times while I was with Sam. And then when I got back into the relationship with Mildred, where again, all everything that happened, we'll talk about a little bit later about everything that happened with her and Aussie. I mean, I just got immediately sucked right back into it. And I remember Sam telling like, you know, podcasts in the last few weeks and stuff, like just how my energy completely changed from like this happy, like, oh, I got to wait off my chest right back into the, the toxicity. The heaviness of it all. Before we close the chapter on the trial marriage with Sam, you know, one of, I think the highlights on the show was um, that big fight that you guys had over your dog. The amount of backlash I got, I was not expecting that. I'm like, holy shit. But this is what I will take from it as a learning lesson, right? Um, is when someone is willing to be gentle with you and willing to give you a safe space, um, no, I didn't come out perfect because I was in a very back and forth relationship with Mildred and it's like working a hundred hours a week. And all of a sudden they're like, relax. Like you don't know how to relax and you become a byproduct of someone you've been with for so long. However, um, everything doesn't have to come out of like just a fight, even if like, you know, this is breaking cycles, right? Like breaking cycles of why I feel like. Mildred was constantly victimizing herself in the relationship. I'm like, man, you might've had a bad background, but that doesn't mean that doesn't give you a right to be an asshole to me right now. Um, that was my own learning lesson for, for Sam, because I'm like, man, yeah, I have been in a, you know, kind of crappy relationship for two years and I have been like pushed around and I have been, um, you know, feeling like I don't have any power in the relationship. All of a sudden when I'm put with a gentle energy, I must have on an unconscious level thought I had some power and I projected that, on to Sam immediately. And, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't give you a right to do that just because you've been through a bad past or a bad relationship. So you mentioned during the show that you and Mildred broke up almost every week. So what do you think in your opinion changed within the eight weeks of this entire experiment that resulted in a proposal for you? Mm, that's a really good question. And it comes down to, the main reason why Mildred and I were on that show to begin with, it was because of our weak fall, which was the lack of communication. And you are going through a timeline of eight weeks and you're like, hey, this is what happened yesterday. What can we do to move forward? It's almost like this own weirdly fucked up therapeutic process that actually makes you think and believe that you are working on your communication and it's a narrative storyline you're following. So you're like, okay, we must now be working on our communication. Well, you have cameras that are like kind of shooting at you. And yes, you kind of forget sometimes that the cameras are there, but a lot of times you don't like you, you kind of do and you kind of don't, right? Like you yeah. want to be yeah. uh, authentic to what you're saying, but you're like, okay, I'm going to have this level of self-awareness. I'm just going to probably say it a different way. Um, to soften the blow because I am a good human at the end of the day. And I'm just, you know, like, so there is this level of communication where we actually were working on things and a lot of it had to do with being in a fucking production bubble. And you, I, we never saw it like that. It was the production bubble that we were in and the cameras all around us, what actually made us believe that commu communication was, um, was being worked on. So afterwards, when we got engaged, like you see at the reunion, when all those cameras went down and we were, they just said so long, like, you know, see you on Netflix in a year and a half. <laughs> good um, luck with the relationship. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> good luck, guys. Here's a bottle of wine. Congratulations on your relationship. <laughs> Literally, we got a bottle of wine. Um, and <laughs> within two weeks, not even two weeks, it was, it was a seven days of getting back home, we got in a fight. Mildred took off her ring. I, I want to ask you about the reunion because Mildred made 
a ton of accusations against you. Um, you know, she said you were on dating apps and had dates over the house that you both shared at the time. You wanted people to come over to play quote unquote sex games. And um, she also said that you tried to make her special needs son pay rent at the home. And I know you never got the chance to tell your side of it um, at the reunion, but what is your side? Like, I guess, like, how did you feel in the moment? Like, what did you actually want to say? Yeah. Um, you know, so actually, this is the first uh, podcast where I've actually talked about what actually happened um, a little bit at the reunion. So believe it or not, I think because, you know, you guys have like a little insider when it comes to like reality TV and all that. Um, after I left, like uh, when I went outside, cried, Sam came and got me. I sat back in the room. I came back in the studio. I sat in the room, um, talked to a therapist on site for like 20, 30 minutes. Um, I'm not going to lie. Like, of course they wanted me to kind of get back on stage. Of course. Um, they didn't force me, but they're like, Hey, I think this is a great opportunity to share your story. Um, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, Hey, you know, maybe you guys don't get it. Um, but in my experience, like, I'm kind of going on stage with what I knew at that time now, after breaking up four or five months of breaking up before the reunion, researching all the stuff on like narcissism and just things like that. I'm like, I'm literally going back on stage with what I see as like my abuser. I did it once. I'm not doing it again. And they're like, okay. So what actually happened was they actually got Joanna to during the reunion um, to get up in front of everyone actually walk off set and actually talk to me in a dressing room on cameras. And, uh, but that part was never filmed. Um, and I think again, to match maybe a storyline, um, I talked to her for like 10, 15 minutes. Um, but this is what I said to her. I said, look, I could, I could sit here and go off and keep in mind that the berating lasted 15, 20 minutes. You guys only saw five, four or five minutes of it. It was going yeah. off 15, 20 minutes at a time. So um, what I said to her, I was like, look, I could literally sit here and go one by one, every single accusation that she went through and say, Hey, this was the truth, but, or this was half truth, or this is something so far fetched. I don't even know what it is. Um, I could go through all 13. I think I counted 13, 14 of them. Uh, when I processed everything, wow. like immediately, even down to like her apparently saying that she borrowed money um, from my mom because like the bills couldn't be paid or something. As soon as I got my phone back after the reunion, mm. I texted my mom. I was like, did Mildred like literally question my reality? I'm like, did you, did Mildred ever borrow money from you? And she was just like, no, what happened? And I'm like, oh, no. oh God, like, you know, cause she, you know, she, of course she's on edge for me and what, what's going to go down with me. But I told Joanna, I said, um, I could sit here and go off every accusation, but I've been doing that for three years. Um, I've been doing that for three years, trying to defend everything that I'm saying, taking accountability for some things, but not, you know, and it's like, they feed off of that energy of you. They feed, it's like sucking your soul apart. And that is the, where the power dynamics come into play. And, um, and I said, She's not like my battle to fight anymore. You called the police on Mildred for domestic violence. That, can I just say, that was probably so tough for you to be on the same stage with her after that incident happening. I think, like, kudos to you for being able to articulate your feelings in that moment. But how did you feel at the reunion talking about that and watching it back? Yeah, so production knew about the DV um, thing kind of early on, but when the reunion came closer, um, you know, they did ask for the police reports just to make sure that they were seeing everything objectively and like, so they could give a copy to Joanna to talk about and everything. Um, so they were aware. Um, but yeah, going on stage with her, I wasn't planning. I mean, I remember telling production, I'm like, I'm not bringing up this DV thing. Like I'm not because it's the hardest thing. I just wanted peace in my life. I think after being in a bad relationship with someone for that, for that long, and I broke up with her, I wanted peace in my life. I just wanted peace and coming back for, yes, I left her, but coming back four to five months into a reunion. Yeah. I know our relationship's complex. I don't want to fucking shame her in public and do this and do that. Like I had every right to feel just as angry as she probably did. There's a lot of things that I was angry about. 
but I wasn't there to smear campaign her. I wasn't there to make weird accusations of her and like all of that stuff to make her look worse. Like I just wanted to get on with my life. And, um, when I told production about it, um, yeah, like I told production, I was like, I'm not bringing it up. I am not bringing it up. And I'm telling you, my gut feeling said that Mildred rehearsed this shit for like months in her head before like it ever came out because she knew that the DV case was probably going to be brought up. You know, she knows all of that. Um, but now looking back on it, the one thing where I learned, I'm like, holy shit. Well, two things is the the double standards. If Mildred was a masculine man and I was, uh, you know, a feminine woman, um, would they have let her on the stage to begin with? I never thought of it like that. Um, and second, if, yeah, second, if I, I, people were like, why would they even bring Mildred on there to begin with? I never saw it like that. And it's weird. Now I do. I'm like, oh man, but when you're in the vortex, right. And you kind of go along with production, what production says, what production yeah. wants, it's almost like you it's kind of normalized. Don't questions. It's yeah. weird. It's like, you just yeah. kind of go through the process. Yeah. They, it's normalized. So I wasn't thinking more so why wasn't Mildred there? The only thing that was going through my mind is I have to be there to defend myself. Like, because yeah. I felt like it would have been 10 times worse if Mildred was not there, the stuff that she probably could have said anything that she wanted to on that stage, because we have a history of her doing that in my relationship. So I was looking at it like, I got to be there. I don't want to be there. I want to throw up. I don't even want to think about it. I have to be there to give myself a fending, like a fighting chance um, to what is about to go down. I knew it was going to be ugly. I had oh. no idea it was going to be that ugly though. Yeah, that was, we didn't talk about it in our last podcast episode where we covered the reunion because we knew you were coming on um, for this episode, but privately Deepi and I were, were like, we felt like the reunion failed you. Like we don't think Mildred should have been allowed mm -hmm. um, on on that stage, and and she shouldn't have been allowed to give in so much time to speak and steamroll you on national, international TV, yeah. a TV show that's seen in multiple different countries. Um, just watching her perjure herself on TV and downplaying the severity of the situation, it was just really tough. Um, so. I'm sorry you had to go through that. That was really hard to watch for Deep D and I, and I can't imagine people at home as well watching it, but also people who are victims of domestic violence and having them see such a serious situation, like just kind of being like, yeah, just like kind of being looked over upon on a huge show. So um, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, I'm, I, I can't believe you were put in that situation is all I can say. It's um, also tough. Uh, you know, no, I'm not a man in a heterosexual relationship, but to an extent, it almost kind of feels like that. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that are definitely supporting me and I, the love has definitely helped me like heal again. Right. Because you can heal, but then when it's aired to the world, it kind of rip opens a bandaid all over again. You're like, Oh man. Um, yeah. But like the, it did hit a little hard because there, I think that it's kind of like our situation is a little bit back and forth. You know, I think more people, I guess, are on my side, if you could say, but the, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what, what, it's a conspiracy, right? It's like, is it this person or is this person the problem? And um, mm -hmm. I honestly think if I was a feminine woman and a Mildred was a man, or a mas more masculine person, um, I think it would have been tipped even more over. I think there is this level of like, it almost starts to even out on the seesaw a little bit, or it's a little bit more because of um, the fact that I am a more masculine presenting person. Um, because I get a lot of messages, unfortunately, they're still like, was it really that serious? Was it this? Was it this? You know, and I I'm just kind of like, at this point, like, She's lifting a 30 pound dog gate and throwing at me on my head at the top of a staircase. If that would have my mom and she would have hit my mom and my mom, my mom has multiple sclerosis. If she would have fallen down that stairs. My mom would have cracked her head open and died. So like, yes, it's that serious. And it, mm -hmm. 
they're using uh that that's in itself is a misdemeanor they're using a lethal weapon at that point it's considered a lethal weapon so like where do you draw the line of where to actually call the cops if she's you know um blocking the door if she's doing all these things that like she's admitting in the police report like like it's it just it's wild it's wild to me and um i did not i will say i did not appreciate the whole yoli thing um you know, Yoli and I were cool as shit for yeah. eight months or, you know, after filming, Yoli and I talked all the time. Um, to be honest, Mildred did not like Yoli because she thought that Yoli and I had something going on and she did not like Yoli at all. Um, but she played it off very, very well. Um, and she thought that Yoli and I had something going on and it, in the police report, um, I actually did not talk about this on the YouTube thing. In the police report itself, um, Mildred talks about, hey, like, you know, uh, we were recently on a reality TV show and um, we were fighting about whether or not someone is in their, um, someone, a cast member is currently involved in their lives or not. Um, that actually had to do with Yoli. She thought that I was messing or trying something with Yoli. And it says it right there in the police report. Um, and she threw the dog gate at me in the name of Yoli. And that, that's like Uh, something to this day where I'm just kind of like, are you kidding me? So it eats me alive and it disgusts me personally when I see Mildred being all friends with, um, friends with Yoli. Um, Yoli and I were fine up until about three, four days before the reunion. We were fine a week before the reunion. Yoli and I were on the phone for eight hours talking. Um, what changed? Um, what changed? What changed? Uh, I think it had something to do with the police report. Um, I, at the end of the day, I don't know, but I did tell Yoli, I'm like, Hey, I'm just letting you know, like, this is what the police report says. Um, and I know that it has to do, I mean, obviously uh, Yoli already knew, um, when that happened between Mildred and I, I actually called Yoli and I was just like, Hey, like, this is what's happened. Um, you know, like she threw like a fucking dog at me and Yoli is telling me, she was like, do you want me to call Mildred? Um, to like, say that nothing's going on between us because no, everything was platonic between Yoli and I, do you want to, um, you know, like have me talk about it? And I'm like, no, because I, apparently I'm not even allowed to be talking to you right now, you know? And it was just like, you know, we were just talking about a little bit of her ML and that's it. So like, you know, none of that was allowed. And then I'm like, oh my God, I don't even want you to clear it up to Mildred because then I'm going to be shamed by Mildred for even talking to you to begin with. Um, when there was nothing but platonic vibes going on with you and I. So anyway, we were fine. And then when we broke up, we started talking more. And then a few days before the reunion, I'm thinking, I don't know. I will never know to this day. Um, Vanessa and I talk about it a lot. The only thing I'm thinking is that Mildred may have reached out to Yoli and then they had a long conversation and maybe it was twisted a certain way. Yeah. That's kind of frustrating because it's like, why not get your side of it too? It's like so one-sided, mm-hmm. you know, but well, she did you... have your side. I feel like she did have your side and then she kind of just sided with regardless of like, I know people are always like the truth is in the middle, but at the end of the day, Mildred committed domestic violence against you and the abuser in that situation is never in the right. No, nothing justifies domestic violence. And so that's why, sorry, I'm getting riled up about this, but I was like, it just, it doesn't, the whole, your relationship with Yoli, just getting that contest, it just doesn't make sense. Cause Deep T and I were even talking about this in our last episode. Like, did you even know that they were close? I was like, we had no idea. Yeah. So, so Yoli and like, Mildred were she, not close the entire time like they were a little close on the show you know because i think i think it's like there's a a culture similarity and things of that nature so they kind of like latched on to that the way i looked at it was uh the way i interpret it was you know keep your um keep your friends close keep your enemies closer that's the way i saw it you know we know that you aren't close with yoli um but who are you closest to from the cast (laughs) yeah um i'm closest with i would say sam and vanessa um and then I still talk to Xander. We'll occasionally talk to Mal. We'll occasionally talk to Ray. Um, occasionally talk to Aussie. Aussie doesn't talk to anybody. <laughs> Aussie's on the grid somewhere. <laughs> Aussie is in Aussie's world. Yeah, Aussie's in Aussie's world. Um, so I think I talk to everyone. 
I think I'm like business cordial, I guess you could say with Lexi. Um, I wish her well, like have nothing mm-hmm. bad to say against her or nothing. Um, you know, I, I'm, I heard she has a new girlfriend. She's happy cool with her. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I kind of at least cordially like talk to most people with just no, no uh, Mildred, no Yoli. And then just like, it's just differences. I just really don't talk to Lexi that much. <laughs> Tiff, we have one last question for you. What is next for you? What does life look like post show? What are you working on? What does the future hold? <laughs> Honestly, I, I I wish I knew. I really don't. <laughs> um, I mean, like, of course, I know you all have like both stepped into the influencing world. Um, so yeah, I've been like dibble dabbling that for a little bit, um, seeing what's you know what's up with that. I. Um, Definitely want to make sure that everything I'm doing is authentic to myself, though. Um, it's also, I don't believe in Pride Month anymore. It's Pride season. Um, so there's, like, a lot of different events that I'm, like, hosting at. Um, so I'll be hosting, like, San Diego Pride. Um, I'm going to be hosting Long Beach Pride. I did L.A. I did Denver a few weeks ago. And then I'm flying out to um, Las Vegas and Palm Springs and... Um, you know, Phoenix, I think, is in the oh. works right now. So, like, a lot of kind of like, it's kind of like the, the lesbian world tour. You know? <laughs> Love that. The lesbian world tour. <laughs> yeah. And then after the summer, right, then I can kind of, like, collect myself and be like, okay, like, what do I want this to go? I de- all I know for sure is that I definitely, when it comes to queer representation in the media, um, there isn't enough representation, period, especially in the reality world, especially on such a large platform as you know, Netflix is, um, a lot of movies, a lot of shows feature people who are queer, but when the, um, cameras go down, you know, they're not really seen that much anymore. Um, so I think that there's kind of like this beauty in disguise of like, although we're not perfect, um, you know, we, when the cameras go down, like we're still here and we still are who we are, um, regardless of who we love or who we are, you know? And, um, I think that that, is very monumental in a piece of kind of like connecting, connecting the world um, and filling the, the gaps, you know, for mm-hmm. such a um, a world that is so polar opposite. You know, you're either on this side or this side. So I think, yeah. you know, I, I all I want to all I do know is that I want to help do my part in helping to bridge the gap. Um, I wouldn't say straight up activism or so, but just uh, kind of help normalize. Um, you know, just that we're not that much different than everybody else. I mean, come on, like, Deep D, Natalie, like, you know, like, we become besties on the show. Like, we're not Well, I know. Absolutely. I was going to say, Absolutely. I feel like you're, like, one of my close friends now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you going to come and to Chicago? You got to oh come to gosh, Chicago. I want to. I want to. Okay, well, um, let us know. Honestly, we we are here, and we'd love for you to come visit, or we'll come wherever you are. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. Yes. You've been to San Diego, right? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I love San Diego. I it's haven't. It's beautiful yeah. out there. You haven't. Oh, let's so, do it. I got to It's like the Southern California vibes, but it's not as materialistic mm-hmm. and uh, polluted <laughs> as LA. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Good me. to know. Okay. Cause yeah. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of LA, but I was like, I feel like I could do San Diego. Um, yeah. but not a big fan either. thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Um, we are so lucky to have you and we feel like we learned so much and we're so glad that we could be a platform for you to share more of your story since you really didn't have the chance to at the reunion and, um, come back anytime. We love talking to you. So thank you so much, Tiff. I love that. Thank you so much thank for the you, opportunity. Tiff. And just like, oh my God, like now I'm going to be going back to fangirling after this. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. As always, we love, love, love hearing from you. So please continue sending all of your thoughts and your comments to our Instagram page at Out of the Pods. Make sure you leave a review and subscribe. Yes, leave that review, please, because we love reading them and hearing your feedback and your thoughts and just your kind messages. So see you next Monday. Bye. Dunna, dunna, dun, dun, dunna.